May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. The scripture today asks us to consider who we talk to when we talk to God. How we imagine God. Who and what we understand God to be. It makes a huge difference. I mean, the opening collect, the Lord mercifully received the prayers of your people who call upon you. Well, who's the you? Upon whom do you call? A part of what I deeply believe is at the heart of Christian discipleship is not just our formation, but also, and I think even more importantly, our perception meaning who we see and know God to be, the one to whom we relate. Let me give you an example. When I was in seminary, I was talking with a friend of mine, and we were just having the kind of seminarian conversations that one has at 11 o'clock at night, which means probing the depths of theological intricacies with lots of intellectual argumentative gusto. And um, those are what, if you ask clergy what they remember and like about seminary, that will be one of the things they will say. Because those conversations rarely happen in other contexts. And for some clergy, it hasn't happened since. <laughs> um, and I, I realized in my sort of listening to myself talk to this good friend that who I imagined God to be up here was very different to the God to whom I related down here. I could quote all of the appropriate scripture about the kindness of God. But in fact, my heart believed and responded to someone very different than the one that I believed in up here that I said I could sort of, yeah, this is who God is, the name is attributes and the like. That while I believe deeply as an intellectual concept, grace and mercy, forgiveness, inclusion. I belong to him. He's never going to let me go. He will never leave me or forsake me. In fact, what I actually envisioned, that a part of what the call of God looked like was a high wire act, <laughs> where I was going from here, and here's the rope. And my job was to get to the other side. Sure, there's grace, but you know what grace looked like? <coughs> the beam that you could hold to make sure that perhaps you might not fall, and the fact that there was a net under you if you were to fall, but it was still, still incredibly scary, personally demanding, and actually pretty isolated. Because when you're on a high wire act, you're all up there by yourself, and everybody's watching you perform. That's the key word, perform. And I really understood that to be, in essence, at least my heart believed, <coughs> even though I would argue to the contrary, my heart believed that's what God had asked of me. And that says volumes about what my heart believed about God. Perfectionistic, demanding, uh, relatively unforgiving, and someone who expected everything. That's what my heart believed, even though I would argue to the contrary. Now, here we have in the scripture two, in some ways, complementary, not conflicting, pictures of God. The Exodus story in Jesus' teaching. The Exodus story is Jesus, I mean, sorry, Moses standing literally in the presence of God, and he's getting. A mandate. Here's what I want you to do. This is a God who commands. And when Moses asks him the question, well, when they say, who is it that sent you? What Moses gets back is an enigma. He doesn't get clarity. The, the phrase about which there have been volumes and volumes and volumes can be translated, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. 
And I have a couple of modern translations of the Pentateuch that translate the phrase, I am there, meaning location. In other words, it's as if what God is really saying to Moses is, I'm here, I am the Lord. That's the other word that's used, which means I am sovereign over all authorities, which is why he said, you can go to Israel and you can go to the king of Egypt, but peace came because I'm Lord over both of those. You don't have to worry. So sovereign Lord authority, one who commands obedience, one who is present in history, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and active in history, not a bystander, and yet not someone uh, who is inviting intimacy. Because in many ways, when Moses asks God, who are you? What's your name? Who will I say? How God responds is almost like this. Here's who I am. In other words, you're actually not capable of understanding my nature. Who I am is beyond your comprehension. But certainly... I am here, present, full of authority, with every right to ask of you the things I am commanding you to do. Now look at that, and then look at Jesus. The famous lines at the end of the passage, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I'm gentle and lowly of heart. You will find rest for your souls stands at least in our minds, if we're not careful, in conflict with the picture of what's given, what God gives Moses in Exodus. I would not want to say they're in conflict. I would actually would say they complement. Because you see, as Jesus says very carefully, no one knows the Father except those whom the Son reveals. And as Paul writes in Colossians, what we see in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily in our midst so that the God that we see in Jesus is nothing less than everything that we that was revealed to Moses in the book of Exodus he is still the sovereign Lord which means he is in fact over all authorities he is the maker of heaven and earth through whom the word was spoken and all things came to be all of that is in Jesus and if we don't have that as a part of our picture of who Jesus is, our relationship will suffer as a result because it will be casual, overly familiar, taken for granted, and kind of lackadaisical. Yeah, God understands. In a way that actually is inappropriate to his nature. He, he's never the one who comes in the midst of our difficulty and says, oh, it's all right. God never says it's all right. God says, let's see what we can do. And here's what I want to do through you and in you. But on the other hand, if all we have is the Exodus picture, and we don't hear the word of Jesus and how the two, in fact, are melded together, what we do have is one certainly to be revered, certainly to be obeyed, but not one with whom an invitation into intimacy is possible. And therefore, that's the God that looks a lot like the God that I believed in in my heart as the guy on the high wire, trying to do his best, but terrified he's going to fall off the line. I would want to say to you that we need to hear both profoundly and deeply not just as a sort of Trinitarian issue, but instead because the one to whom you relate is the one in whom you believe. And that affects your prayers, that affects how you think about discipleship, it affects how you think about mission, it affects how you think about stewardship, obligation, and all of the, and particularly in the areas of things like personal transformation, forgiveness, in God's companionship. Particularly when Jesus invites us into the kind of relationship that literally says, take my yoke upon you. Well, to be yoked to the Lord of heaven and earth could feel like you're chained to a tiger. 
And that's not far off. It's not far off. But it also means we are, in fact, directly connected to one who chooses out of love to take the expansive nature of all of who he is in great power and make it personally and intimately accessible in the form of one human being who chooses to walk beside us and with us and literally keep his judgmental power at bay for the sake of those whom he loves. So please do not be too informal in the presence of deity. Do not take his forgiveness for granted. Do not be so casual as to ape the kind of over-familiar nature that's so much a part of our relationships as humans in this culture in which we live. We actually enjoy knocking authority off its pedestal. Don't let that infect your relationship with God. But instead, the word it seems to me that is appropriate is honor. Honor. That it seems to me carries both the intimacy and the awe that is the one to whom we are joined, not just by a yoke, but organically through baptism <clears throat> and the commitment and the invitation to walk with him in a way that invites honor though we often fail I think is the gate G-A-I-T that is appropriate for believers Amen, Amen.